it's really frustrates me still talking about that semi final because I still I still believe we're the better team even then. Um, for me, it's mentality. Their mentality is unbelievable. Being truthfully honest with you, when when I first went over to France, I was I genuinely thought I'd made the biggest mistake of my life because I struggled so bad. I missed home. I did not. I obviously I couldn't speak French. But what what was right was my football, and I knew I was playing so well in training. I knew I was improving. I was surrounded by the best players on the planet. The way of thinking was just something I've never experienced. And I can give you a story. So like Wendy would be speaking about the final before we played the quarter final. Wow. wow. And I would. <laughs> <laughs> when I knew Man City was in, interested, I said to my agent at the time, like that's the one. That's that's where I want to go. Um, if we can make that possible, then I would be really keen to, to get that one over the line and done. Do you know what I'm actually f interested in what they said? Because we're very similar people, the three of us. Like we spend a lot of time together on camp, bus free, and everything we speak about is clothes, shoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best trainers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's got the latest dumps that have come out? If they haven't, I have, and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> Hello listeners and welcome back to yet again another episode of the Beautiful Game podcast. As ever, I'm your host Budge, joined by my faithful two co-conspirators Dot and Dej. Gents, how are we doing? I'm good, Budge, man. What's good? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, not too bad. How are you keeping? I'm very well, thank you. How about you, Dej? I'm doing very, very well, bro. It's not every day you're joined <laughs> by quadruple winners, so I'm looking forward to this chat. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We are joined by a very special guest in very well-esteemed company. I'm sure Dej will, will, would agree with me, given the fact that we're both left-backs. This is a special yeah. one for us. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we've got a particular affinity to this player. You know, after winning everything that there, there is to win, possibly um, at Lyon last season, she traded East Central France for a return to Manchester, this time the blue side of Manchester. Of course, throughout her career, she's been privileged enough to play for both clubs in both Manchester and in Merseyside. She's a, a former winner of the FA Women's Young Player of the Year in 2012. If she was in the Matrix and Morpheus was presenting her with both the blue and the red pill, she'd probably take both of them and couldn't decide between blue or red. Without further ado, ladies and gents, we welcome Alex Greenwood to the platform. Welcome, Alex. Welcome, welcome, welcome. welcome. Hello. <laughs> what an that was. <laughs> you know Absolute what? pleasure to have you on, Alex. Look, pleasure to be here. You know what? Just to quickly, obviously, I know we were going to start off with England, but how difficult is it playing for, like, both teams in Manchester and both teams in Liverpool? Is it like, is there that big rivalry there in the women's game or is it more civil than the men's game um no funny funny you speak about it actually i mean i can laugh about it now it's it's actually very funny um but i've taken so much abuse on social media from this um it's probably been a, like a really difficult time like the last couple of months more so when i first signed actually um i had to come away from social media completely it was just too much um I, i've said this so many times and i'll say it again but I always expected like some form of criticism. I'm, I'm not stupid. Like I grew up in Liverpool. It's a city made for football. Um, I was a fan myself one day, and you know I used to shout stuff to players and stuff like that about how they played and and so on. But for me, it's it, when it becomes personal, it's it's different. Um, I don't think there's there's any right or reason given why it has to be personal. If anyone ever criticizes my performances, I have no problems with that. People are gonna like you, people aren't gonna like you. That's that's part and parcel of football. Um but when it crosses the line, that, that for me was when it got a little bit difficult. Um so really to answer your question, as as funny as it is now, um it hasn't hasn't been plain sailing. It's been quite difficult to to read some of the things I've had to read over the last couple of months. Um but it probably opened my eyes a little bit um, to be a bit tougher um, and probably just ignore a lot of people on social media because ultimately don't really know me personally. And they just know the teams I've played for and that's what they judge me on, unfortunately. 
Yeah, so in terms of that dynamic, how have your family been? Because growing up, I know you're a Liverpool fan, so you've played for the Merseyside rivals. Obviously, yeah. right now, you're playing for the current rivals, and you've also played for Liverpool's long-term rivals, Manchester United. So mm -hmm. is there a bit of that banter and that needle, or are your family good with it? No, my me, me family are great. They support me in whatever decision yeah. I make. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, like, the the split down the middle i've got half my family are blue half my family are red it's normal where i'm from um so yeah i've t taken some crap like from me from my family but all light-hearted and, and fun um but every decision i've made whether it was to go abroad to jump ship in merseyside to jump ship in manchester it was always fully supported with a, probably a little few jokes along the way yeah, hundred percent. You know what? I wanted to ask another question, Alex, off the field. So, um, obviously, you're you're um, uh, in a uh, a relationship with another uh, professional footballer, and I I I always wanted to ask, like, obviously, generally in relationships, right? You you get a bit of you know a bit of banter, a bit of fun, like if you're out in the back garden, for example, in a like a standard one on one. But given the fact that you're both professional footballers, does that get a, a lot more competitive and a lot? um you know m more i guess uh yeah a, a, a lot more competitive I, I, <laughs> I say, um with with the standard sort of 1v1s in a back garden um yeah oh god it's a competitive household i'll tell you that um, yeah in lockdown we had a, a tech board you know the yeah you play yeah. across yeah 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 in the end, we had to stop. We had to stop. It was gonna, we we're gonna end the relationship. Was gonna end for sure. It was getting so <laughs> bad. We used to have like we used to have bets and stuff. He was gonna win. We, uh, whoever won would buy so someone else. And two foot got, challenges. Honestly, it was getting really bad. <laughs> bad. Like really, cool. and even like in lockdown when we were, like, had to go out and do our fitness stuff, we did it together. Um, talking more the last one than than this one because we're both privileged to still be able to go to tra training. Um. But he'd have like running sessions and so would I. And if his running was more than mine, I was thinking, nah, I'm doing this. Like, he ain't doing more than me today. No chance it was, it was that bad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, again, obviously it's it's all fun and games and we're, we're really honest with each other and stuff like that. But yeah, it's really competitive house to live. In terms of the, the dynamic at England, obviously you're flooded with world-class players, Lucy Bruns, yourself. Leah Williams then Jill Scott <laughs> how do you take that next step to go from nearly winning to now winning I mean as a team or individually as a team yeah um I've probably gone out of our comfort zones a little bit um which is which we you know challenging challenging each other in probably ways that we haven't felt comfortable to do in the past um it's easier said than done in a, a team full of players who are from different clubs uh have different um, still wear different attitudes towards things. Um, but yeah, for me, I think we're at a stage now where we could probably challenge each other on things that we might not have done in the past. If training isn't good enough, the standard off the pitch isn't good enough. Um, we are all elite athletes, but sometimes you know standards do do slip um, without even knowing it. It's probably just taking a player or a couple of players to to realise it and, and and let each other know that it's. First of all, probably not acceptable, and and secondly, that the standard needs to stay high if you want to win win medals, and that's definitely what I know every player wants to do. So, in the dressing room, who are those leaders? Those people that set the standards? Because in every dressing room, you've got like a leadership of three or four. Like I support Liverpool, and there's like a committee of players that are formed the leadership team. So, in the England women's team, who are those people? Do you know what? As, as weird as the sound, we have leaders in different ways. So, like, we have vocal leaders, Skipper, Steph, um, Jill, Lucy, to a certain mm. extent. Lucy is vocal, but also quiet about business. Mm. She does things in different ways. Probably myself in there. If it, something needs to be said and it's the right time, I don't, I don't mind saying it. Um, but I'm, I'm more of, like, a people person. I'd rather speak to an individual than speak to a whole group. Um, some people are more comfortable. Millie, Millie is vice captain at a club. She's more than comfortable to stand up and speak. And then you get like Fran, who's really quiet. Um, she does all the talking on the pitch, which is <laughs> which is fine, and that's their way of leading. Um, so yeah, you've got a twenty-one mixture of individuals who lead in very different ways. But when it comes together, it can be quite powerful. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's a really interesting point, Alex, because again, it, it's something that naturally we'd always want to have more insight in terms of, you know, a, a woman's dressing room and, and what the dynamics are, are like um, and, and basically how you manage, you know, the different people and, and the, the ways that they like to receive information and that kind of stuff. And, and would you say that that is at the same level at, at club as well as country? Or, or is it is there a, an additional sort of step up or, or impetus at England? Because, of course, you know, you're, you're surrounded by players at the top of the game who've, you know, won things throughout their careers and that kind of thing. I think both are very similar, but also very different. Obviously, at club, we have World Cup winners, Champions League winners, FA Cup winners. Every player's riddled in trophies. Um, so everyone's ego is different. Everyone's expectations different. Likewise, at England, we all come from different clubs. So away from England, all our club egos are different. You know, our relationships with each other are different. Um, so it's it's hard because we spend every day together at club. So we, we know each other inside out. Um, I probably know how every single player at City reacts to a certain way of someone speaking. Um, but at the same time, we do do a lot of work at England on that. On that stuff, it's it's massive right now. Um, how you speak to each other, and obviously in in the middle of a game, if it's ninety minutes and we're one nil up against USA, my head's not thinking, oh, how does Lucy want to be spoken to in this moment? It means we win the game. That gets forgotten about, and we all understand mm-hmm. that. We're at that point now. Whereas, I think maybe in the past, you know, myself included, you you probably take things personally. She's saying that because I don't play for the club, but you start questioning things and. It's totally not the case, you know, we're all here for the same reason. Um, and that's to win trophies, whether your friends, best friends or can't stand each other. It's we're all there for for the same reason and that's that's to win. Very, yeah. very oh, go on. No, that, I was just gonna say very well said. Mm. Yeah, I was gonna say America, the USA, is the benchmark for women's football. Like everyone says it, like there was a semi-final 2-1 a few years ago that England obviously lost. Do you feel like that gap is getting closer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really frustrates me still talking about that semi-final because I still I still believe we're the better team even then. Um, for me, it's mentality. Their mentality is unbelievable. They... It's similar to Leon in, in, in a weird way. I mean, I've never been in USA camp, obviously, but I've got three girls from the USA national team who play with me now. Oh, so yeah. I see them every day. I see how they work. I see how they speak, etc. cetera. Um, but I refer it back to Leon a little bit because they're just serial winners. Um, and no matter how well you've trained in the week or how preparation's gone or form, for that matter, nothing really gets up here. Nothing really... Mm gets in the way of we're going to win this game however way we have to. Um, and that was the same, same at Leon. That was exactly how he was. And I think our mindset maybe back then wasn't quite as strong as that. Um, other things that we couldn't control, maybe we let control our, our performance mm. uh, as best as I could put it, really. But f- for me, in terms of technically, tactically, I think we're, we're there, if not better. In, in my opinion, it just their mentality. And when you've won, it becomes it becomes second nature to find yeah. a way to win. And you have that upper hand already. Um, so second, did they have like an aura? So like when you were coming yeah. up against them, would you think, oh, this is USA. This is the biggest game in my life. But whereas the USA, they sort of seem to have that aura like, we're going to win. We believe in our source kind of thing. Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, we're not lining up in the tunnel and I'm going oh my God, should I say, like, they've already won the game. Absolutely not, not like that. I mean, just on the pitch, clever things, you know. Yeah. Do you know what, Alex? You 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 said a really important key word just then in your answer, which was mentality. And I wanted I wanted to use that key word and, and basically rewind back to when you were first making your your sort of your first appearances on the scene and 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 like your first official season um back at Everton, right? Now at the time, I think it was back in 2012. So you would have been what, 17, 18 at the time? Oh, 6, 15, 16 then? 15, 15, fine. Okay. So and when you were making your 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 first sort of appearances in the first team, you were sort of deputizing from Rachel Unit, right? She's obviously the long standard left back at the time. She then moves on to, to Birmingham City. 
and you're thrust into the in, into the limelight at that point. So what was what was that kind of transition like for you? Being so young, having you know big boots to fill, given the fact that you know she was she was ever present in the team. Like I know obviously that season you went on to win young um, young player of the year, but like talk us through ha- like what that process and that that kind of period was like for you. I think. Um... Firstly, unit was brilliant for me, Rachel. She was absolutely brilliant for me through coming through the first team. If I ever needed anything or if I ever needed some advice on left back, um, she was the first person I would go to and she'd give me it. She, she always said, this position's yours. Like Sooner rather than later, you're, you're taking my place. And I think when I broke into the team, I sort of gauged that she was probably coming to the end by the time at Everton. So in the back of my head somewhere, I knew, okay, when she's going, no one else is coming in. Mo and Mo Marley at the time, who was an unbelievable mentor for me, um, probably prepared me brilliantly to just step in and, and take a place. Was I as good as her? No way, not at the start. Um, absolutely miles away from what she was at that time. But I knew the players I was playing with, Farrah Williams, Tony Duggan, Michelle Hennigan, I mean, Jill Scott, the list is endless. I knew I was in a, in a safe place. Mm. Um, so, so for me coming in, I w- and I was quite a confident kid. I wasn't, um, I wasn't, I wasn't arrogant with it. I wasn't cheeky. Maybe some would disagree, but I, I was, <laughs> I was quietly confident. And I knew I was ready to step up and, and take that position. And I was very well prepared for it. I had little glimpses of the Champions League football. Twenty minutes here, ten minutes there. And then when it was time to step up and step in, I, although I was only 16 years old, I felt, okay, the, sea, the league probably wasn't as good then as it is now. It was probably perfect timing. And like I said, Mo Marley for me was instrumental. She'd criticise me when I needed it. She'd put an arm around me when I needed it. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was all it was all down to Mo, really, who, who led me to believe I was ready to start for WSL yeah. team. Last one on this before we move on to life outside of football. Obviously, you mentioned that when you were breaking through, you were confident. Do you think that's kind of like a trait coming from Liverpool? Because we've seen Trent Alexander-Arnold burst in, onto the scene and just have some crazy level of confidence. Curtis Jones, he's doing stepovers for fun. You saw his performance <laughs> in the Champions League last night. Just top performance. Like, Do you think that's a trait that comes from the Liverpool area? Yeah, it's, it's hard to share with people who aren't from where we're from. Hmm. without sounding arrogant if that makes sense so yeah you some people who don't really get it are like are they arrogant are they cocky or are they just what is it it's it's not um it's not neither of them it's just you grow up you play on the streets um you're either good or or, or you're not it's you get found out quite early on the streets it's simple as that um and when you're good you probably you probably more or less know that that you're half decent um, so I think that does play a factor where you come from, how you're brought up, type of person that you are. It's probably say I'm, I'm really humble and so, so grateful for where I came from. Um, but at, at the same time, I knew, I knew I was good. I knew I could play football, but I would never stand up and say, pick me, I'm, I'm the best player. I would never do that, I'd say, OK, wait till they pick me and, and then kind of show them, if that makes sense. Uh, definitely. Mm-hmm. Like, before we move on to outside of football... I wanted to ask about your last three years. Obviously, you've had three different clubs. You're at Manchester United, you got promoted, and obviously you've gone to Lyon, and yeah. now you've come back to Manchester City. How is that as a player? Because for me, that is very, very rare. I don't think I've heard about that before, heard that happen at such mm-hmm. a high level. Obviously, you're in the championship, then you go to Lyon, where there's just that winning mentality, and now you're coming back to Manchester City. So how has that been? Because... When you go into a different team, there's different philosophy, different players to get used to. So has that been sort of like a turbulent experience or break it down to us from your perspective? A whirlwind. Um, you go from being captain of Manchester United with an expectation to get the club promoted, go and be in, um, be a leader, look after a team who have just been put together in a space of six weeks under a new manager under all the possible circumstances you wouldn't be able to think of. Um, and for sure, that absolutely made me as a person uh, in terms of like leadership skills and stuff. 
so I had a responsibility not just to take care of my my performances, but then to look after everyone else's um, drive standards in training, have difficult conversations, challenge managers, something I've never really had to do before. So to do a free three sixty to go across the pond to live in a different country um, to speak a language I've never spoke before with serial winners and not have any of that expectation of being a leader um, challenging people just fitting piece of the jigsaw basically so I went from really one extreme to the other quite literally um, and being truthfully honest with you when, when I first went over to France I was I genuinely thought I'd made the biggest mistake of my life because I struggled so but I missed home I did not obviously I couldn't speak French but what what was right was my football and I knew I was playing so well in training I knew I was improving I was surrounded by the best players on the planet every single day and their mentality was something I can never explain to you it's incredible um and once Christmas came I probably started to settle down a little bit um, so by then I could speak a little bit of French so I could understand the training sessions I could have a conversation with people um, quite comfortably and I could probably show my personality a little bit more to them yeah. and, mm. and at that point I think I was I felt like I was home then I loved it from Christmas onwards was just the best seven, eight months of my life um, we won trophy after trophy after trophy which helps yeah, <laughs> massively yeah. um, and I loved the girls there they were as much as from the outside looking in, you know, you go, I had a heck of a big, Wendy Renard, Amel, Maro, Sarah, I could name, Amandine Henry, Lucy, I could name all them players and you'd be like, God, I bet you the this, I bet you the egos are like that. I couldn't be further from the truth. They were all brilliant people before footballers, um, looked after you, very different to what I've been used to before. But I think for me, the the way of thinking was just something I've never experienced. And I can give you a story. So, like, Wendy would be speaking about the final before we played the quarterfinal. Wow. wow. And I would... Oh, not. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. that, that's not arrogant at all. Like, mm. she never once was like, yeah, we're going to win. But I remember stopping and saying, hey, Luce, why are they asking us where we're going to be staying in the final? And we ain't even, we ain't even won the quarterfinal yet. And she said, wow. Alex, that's how they work. They plan for the final. It's... The simple as that. We plan to get to a final, and I remember just sitting back and thinking, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna win. We're gonna win Champions League." And don't get me wrong, we we weren't even playing very good football. I was watching our games leading into Champions League. And I'm thinking, "We're gonna be lucky here. if if we don't pull ourselves together. We could we could have a shock here and get knocked out." Turns up to game day, and we turn up. Leon turn up as they do. And he deliver and, and we get to the hotel that we spoke about two weeks ago. <laughs> wow. Crazy. So ultimate ultimate crazy. confidence. It's, it's just mentality and it it changed France changed me completely in a better way, way of thinking, being okay to actually say, I do want to be the best left back, left side centre back in the world. I wanna be. I wanna win the WSL this year. Of course I do. But I wouldn't come home otherwise if I didn't want to do that. So I think for, in the past we've always been a bit scared as English people to go. Yeah, we want to win the World Cup. I think we can win because we, we have that fear of, of letting people down or, yeah. or failure. Fear yeah. of failure, I suppose. And it's not a bad thing, but it's also not a bad thing to sit in and go, you know what? Yeah, I want to be the best player in the world. Definitely. So 100%. at Leon, did you actually have an option to stay or was you always going to return back? Because obviously you're winning trophies, quadruple, yeah. as I mentioned at the start. And obviously you've come back to Manchester City. So what actually governed that decision for you to come back home? I think at Christmas, before I left to go home for Christmas, I had a conversation with the manager and I said, this was when I was probably struggling a little bit. I said, listen, I, I know I've only signed one year, but I think I'm going to go home after this year. I understand if you don't use me as much as you need to because I've decided yeah. to go home. Um, and he says to me, listen, Alex, he said, respect what you're saying. He said, you've got to come back, do six months. We're going to win trophies. Your, your head will change and et cetera. We, we will. So they offered me a two-year contract after okay. Christmas um, because my contract would have been up before COVID uh, came out. Okay. Um, so obviously I, I didn't sign it. I, I left it there. I just wanted to focus on football. And then, obviously, uh, when you're abroad, you can speak to teams abroad after a certain amount of time. Okay, yeah. And obviously, Man City came up, I had a, a 
couple of other options elsewhere, a couple more in England. And when a new Man City was in, interested, I said to my agent at the time, like, that's the one, that's that's where I want to go. Um, if we can make that possible, then I would be really keen to, to get that one over the line and done. And obviously, as these conversations are happening, the more and more I'm enjoying being in France. Oh. So, and in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I'm not sure if I want to go home here. So I had some difficult conversations with myself and my family. And I said, I'm, I'm, obviously, I have a partner here and he's he, he's not going anywhere. He's staying here. And I, I says to my family, I said to him, like, I don't know if I want to come home. Like, I'm, I'm loving my life in France. I love winning trophies. I really enjoy the team. Um, I don't know what to do. I, and I generally, up until the Champions League final, my contract was sorted that Man City. I was going. I think the only way I can put it is when you're on such a high of winning and when you win that Champions League, nothing can compare to that ever at this present moment. Nothing's come close to that. I was also a bit realistic that that would come down at some point. And I would sit there and say, I came, I achieved everything I wanted to. I won every trophy that was possible. Maybe maybe it is a good time to take up this opportunity at City and and go home and be with family again. Um, And I... I wasn't sure if that opportunity would come round again. As much as I believed in my ability, I thought if two more years in France, will this opportunity come again? And I, I wasn't sure, and that wasn't really a risk I wanted to take. So I took up the option. And to be honest with you, it's it's been an unbelievable decision. I've loved every single minute being at the club. I mean, it's not bad signing and then playing in the FA Cup final a couple of weeks later. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah, it was. I think I think I signed at the perfect time. To be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's all my decisions have been not easy. I haven't just Man United don't turn up. I go I'll sign for Man United. So when everything's for, I, I think everything through and mm-hmm. I make sure everything's the right decision for for me and my career. And I like to just go out of the comfort zone a little bit. I could easily have picked stayed in France. I could easily have just gone to an, another team where I probably knew they were going to win or I knew I was going to play. I didn't. I have no guarantees at City. We've got Demi here, world class yeah. left back. Very good mate of mine who I knew I was going to have to go toe to toe with and challenge. And if you want to win, that's that's just what you've got to do. So, what was it about the Manchester City project that made you think, you know what, I'm all in, I have to come here? Because I think it was September last year they announced Lucy Bronze and yourself mm. within the space of 10 to 15 days. And for me, that was a massive statement. So, what was it about their project that made you buy into it? Their mentality to win was ex- it, it referred to uh, Leon a little bit. And yeah, Alex, end- what, Alex what, what? Sorry to interject. What is that mentality? Because us as fans, mentality is almost like a buzzword in football. We yeah. hear Jurgen Klopp <laughs> saying it every week. You know, yeah. Phil Neville when he was the England women's manager. Mentality. What does that actually mean in football? Um, it's such an easy way to use. I think it gets you out of a lot of trouble sometimes. <laughs> 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 to be honest, you've got to have a good mentality now in, in all seriousness. Um, what I mean by it is they they proved it, so they proved they wanted to win. So that, that for me was signing Rose Lavelle, uh, signing Sam Ewers, the talks of Abby coming, uh, sign Chloe, and then all the players that they had there already. For me, that was that was enough for me to say these mean business, these aren't messing about. Um, when you sign Lucy as well, you probably had to pick up every single team on the mm. planet at the time. And I can tell you that you definitely did. To pick that club is speaks for itself as well. And um, so when I knew that was available to me as well, I knew I was going with winners, Rose, Sam, the girls who were already there, myself, Lucy. In, on, in football, everything's about winning. Unfortunately, it's it's what you play for. Mm. Um, so yeah, for me, that that's that's what I refer to as mentality and kind of not letting anything get in your way. So if mm. if you know along the way, it's gonna you're gonna have ups and downs. We we haven't particularly performed at the start of the season how we expected to or wanted to. But I always knew with the team that we had and the way we trained and the way guys was, it was gonna click at some point. And I mean, when it clicks, um, it, I. I think we, I think we can be the best team in the league. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the state of the women's game. Obviously, we've just seen Chelsea go on a 33 game unbeaten run, and there was a whole lot of sort of commotion around Emma Hayes when I think AFC Wimbledon 
vested their interest into her saying they wanted to take her for the managerial role. What did you make of her comments in light of that situation? Because she was basically saying, no, the women's game is not a step down. We're a proper game and all right. So, so what did you think? I thought the way she handled that situation was unbelievable. Um, she's, she's, she's a brilliant manager. I've heard nothing but good things about her as a manager. Um, I've, I've, her comments were spot on, to be honest with you. Um, I think how it looked from the outside was, first of all, massive credit for it to even be spoken about with a, with a men's job, if you want to look at it like that. But then you flip on its head and say, well, are they trying to say that actually working for Wimbledon is much greater than managing Chelsea Women's Football Club. That's that's how it came across to us, mm. um, which is absolutely not the case. She's she's in the highest level of women's football in, in our league. Um, she's she's another one who's a, a born winner. Um, and cl- clearly, you know, where she's at is where she's, where she's happy. I, I'm p- personally so glad that she came out and said what she did. Um, massive statement from from here and for women's football. Um, but I think at at some point in the future, if a woman does take over a, a man's team, a men's team, even, how does that look? Like I, I find that something that's going to be really interesting when it happens. Do does it then say, oh, it is a step forward, a step back? I don't know. Personally, I think she made the right choice, and I think her comments were were spot on. Yeah, 100% well said there, Alex. Um, what I wanted to ask is, going back to, you know, you deciding to, to join City and obviously really buying into the, 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 the project and, and the, the plan going forward. When making those kind of decisions, I know you were talking about missing your family and the fact that that, that was a big part of it all, right? But how, how much influence do your peers have in... A decision as well like did you speak to to Lucy did you speak to Steph did you speak to Ellie before making that decision ultimately and and, and did the, the the opportunity to play with all of those guys influence the, your your decision in some way as well yeah I mean I have massive respect for the players the players who I'm playing with was playing with currently and the potential of the players I was going to play with so I'd never put anyone in an awful situation and um, and obviously respectful to, to Leon, I'd never uh, shout it from the rooftops and be like, make it obvious that I was probably going to sign for City. Um, but obviously under the radar and text messages and stuff, I, I, I think some of the girls at City knew I was signing before I did, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but yeah, obviously I've got really good friends there, Steph being one, Ellie. I spoke to Lucy openly about it because I had an idea that's where she was going. Um, she knew I was looking to go there. Um, so yeah, them conversations do happen. I'd be lying if if they said if I said they never. Um, obviously, just wanted to know what she's where she was stood with the club and what she thought about where the club was at and stuff like that. And she's obviously she she can sit there and lie, but she's not gonna. She's she's a friend, and that's why I asked. And obviously, Ellie being a really good mate. I spoke to her about it quite a lot. Um, and just I just knew with conversation with guys as well that. It was it was per- it was a perfect fit. I knew I was going to go in and be challenged, not not just turn up and play every week, um, and potentially play out of position, which is what which is what I have done, and I've, I've absolutely loved it actually. Oh, that's that's brilliant to hear. So obviously, moving on um, to life outside of football, what kind of hobbies are you interested in? Because when we asked, you know, Leah and Lucy about this. Obviously, we had a very entertaining chat. So, <laughs> what, <I'm okay. laughs> what things keep you ticking? Do you know what? I'm actually f- interested in what they said because we're very similar people, the three of us. Like, we okay. spend a lot of time together on campus, free, and everything we speak about is clothes, shoes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The best trainers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's got the latest dunks that have come out? If they haven't, I have. And I'm <laughs> we even um, we even set each other reminders, you know, when the dunks are coming out, like, girls, girls, three o'clock, make sure you set your alarms, they're coming out, and so stuff like that. But, yeah, we're very similar people. Away, away from football, I am slightly obsessed with clothes and shoes, and um, it's it's massive part of my life, fashion, and 
yeah, I, I love it. It's, I shouldn't say it, but I spend most of my day looking at clothes, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, Alex, who would you say is leading the line? If you had to be honest, in terms of the drip in the England national team, <laughs> who's, who's oh, leading the line? <laughs> Me, 100%. 100%. not even now. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> No, nah, it's it's definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the top three in the camp? So if you were to list everyone, who's what, top three? With, without me or with me? Yeah, without you. Without, without you, without no, you. Without me. Oh, this is hard, you know. I'm going to go... Oh, I'm going to get so much... Am I not allowed to swear, am I? <laughs> We're putting you on a spot, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get a bit of stick in a group chat afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I actually am. I'm going to have to make... So, Oh, in order as well, this is hard. The top three without order would be Lucy, Kira, Leah for me. Ooh. I'll throw Jordan in there as well. Jordan, but Jordan's yeah. different. Jordan's Jordan's very different. Like we're all three of us are very different, but also mm. very similar. Um do you know what? Everyone's got everyone's got orientation now. I wouldn't say anyone turns off. I'm, I'm the stinking, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of terrible shoes on show. I'm not gonna lie, but for the for the most part, everyone's all right. Not not too bad. It's improved. It's got. It's like it's improved. Yeah. Alex, what's the what's the last pair of trainers that you bought? Me. Yeah. The <laughs> last the last pair of trainers that you bought. What were they? Oh, last bit. Of, actually, oh god, I've, I've, I only ordered them yesterday. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the new one. <laughs> hey, so this is a secret, yeah. But wait, there's a three of us at, at City on a van, right? From from buying things at the moment. So I don't know if I'm slipping up here by saying this, but we were, were allowed to order off our Nike account, but we're not allowed to actually spend our own money on it. So there's a difference. So I didn't actually buy them with my own money. I ordered them off the night account. So just oh. to get that in there before them too. Absolutely <laughs> hammer me and tell me that I've spent money. Because I actually haven't. Um, I ordered the new pink dunks, the low ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see yeah. that. I see that. Yeah, well, we had a reminder, the three of us on that. Me, Georgia, <laughs> Kira. Um, we're all on a, on, a, on a spying ban at the moment for a month. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah, been it's quite difficult. Telling you about the level of spending. That you've been up to. <laughs> I mean, when when there's a lockdown, you can't go to shops. The next best thing is to order online. And at mm. CFA, we have a board with everyone's name on who gets deliveries. Now, without without fail, it got to a point where every single day, me, uh, Georgia, Ellie, and Kira were on, and Lucy actually were on that board, and oh. we got we were like. Girls, like this is becoming a bit of a problem. Like, <laughs> why don't we try and do a month where we we don't purchase anything? Like, let's give it a go. And whoever loses, the person who buys something, but has to buy the the ones who are doing it like a okay. present. Yeah. So so far, without lying, without them lying, no one's no one's bought anything. So, and I do believe that they haven't as well. To be fair. Um, so yeah, I can't I can't wait till it's over. To be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I mean, wait. In terms of like social media, we see a lot of footballers now building their brand, building their Instagram. How important is that for you, like post career? I know you've got so many more years left in you. You're still yeah. only, you know, 27. So how important is that social media brand element side of things for you? Yeah, it's massive. Um, do you know what? If you look at my Instagram at the moment, um, it's it's boring to be truthfully honest with you, because and there's a reason for that. Um, I, I chose. I made a decision when I signed for City based on all the stuff that got said to me after after signing and all the criticism I talk and and you know abuse really just to not share any part of my life other than football and I made that conscious decision um, not in fear of anything or more because just to protect myself and family a little bit of whoever I was putting on on social media and. And stuff like that. So I, I took that decision upon myself not to share anything other than football. Um, for that simple reason, to be to be honest. But I have so much to offer other than football. I'm not just your typical boring football. I, I generally have a, a lot to offer. And I want to be a role model away from football to the young girls who, you know, I am very interested in beauty and, and 
hair and nails and etc. And I want young girls to know that you can also be interested in that and play football. Mm. And the only way I'm going to be able to share that is, is by posting stuff on Instagram and being open to, to have them conversations with young girls. And for me, social media is a massive platform now for good and bad reasons, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. Um, good reasons speak for themselves, you know, get out there who you are, bad reasons and what comes with it. And if you're willing to take what comes with it, which unfortunately is how it is. It, it, is it right? Absolutely not. I don't agree with the racial abuse that's going on at the moment, the death threats that's going on at the moment. It's It, it angers me, if I'm honest with you. Speaking about it, it angers me. But unfortunately, it's, I hate to say it, but it kind of comes with, with it at the moment. And that's that's so bad to say. But so in your opinion, what things can be done? Because people are talking about people having to show their passport or authenticity like to be able to sign up you have to show some proof of id what mm. do you think is the remedy for tackling this abuse i've been asked this question a few times i actually got it into the other day and people were like why don't you say, um do like a um we well, all come off you all come off social media the reason why i, I don't want to do that's because they win they yeah. win why would we do that why should we let them win and we have to shut our social media down to that, that for me is is them saying, oh, we won. We won the arguments and you've crumbled and took away your social media. I, I agree. I think there's got to be something done. Um, I actually speak with LJ's a really close mate of mine and we literally just spoke about this on the phone this morning. Um, and when you actually report something on, on Instagram, there's never anything to say racial abuse ever. It's just abuse. And that's mm-hmm. such a generic thing to say. Yeah. What abuse could be anything. It could mm-hmm. be it could be calling me a snake. <laughs> it could be, you know that that's yeah, abuse. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not what yeah. it is. So you can you can get away with calling someone a snake, but you it's not you can't get away with being racist. It's it's unacceptable. There has to be something to show who you are and why you're signing up to the Instagram. Mm. In, in my opinion, and if that if that person is reported. Get them off social media, remove them from it and don't allow them back on because it's too easy to set up another profile to become anonymous and not know who you are. It's far too easy to to to, to give a piece out and get away with it. And it's 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 actually getting worse, not better. Yeah, hundred percent. I think there is definitely a lot that the social media platforms can do to um to try and you know rid the the, the game from from this issue and it's been it's been going on for far too long something's definitely got to be done about it 100 percent um what i wanted to ask you alex so i know in terms of your your match day preparation i know you, you like to have a bit of a coffee in the morning and <laughs> and, and you've got a, a playlist going um uh, on on the way to, to to the stadium who's on your playlist at the moment who's who's the the most played artist what's the what's the song that you can't get enough of at the moment do you know what? You won't believe this yet, but I'm actually the team DJ, right? Uh, I actually am. That's, that's pressure, you know. That's that a big responsibility. Right? That is a big <laughs> no, responsibility. Honestly, do you know in my dressing room? Yeah, do you know the people you've got to please in this dressing room is hard work. Yeah. You can go from Drake to, to Mariah Carey to Neil Diamond in the space of a playlist. <laughs> to the then to the script, I've got to please Steph. I've got to please Ellen White, who likes Miley Cyrus. The, you know, it's such stress and I'm I'm going through your place. I'm thinking, I've recovered everyone today. Is everyone going to be happy? Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we have such a such a mixture of a playlist. Um, I make one for every game. Uh, sometimes I throw it in a group. If you have any suggestions, throw it in. But I'm not doing that anymore because you can't please everyone. So <laughs> this is it. Um, for, for me, it's a range. You know, I go from diff- if I'm driving to training in the morning, it takes me about half an hour to get to training. I'm just chilled, just chill vibe, like as relaxed as possible. Um, if my day's gone all right, I, I might I might turn the volume up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but going to the game, I tend to listen to the playlist I've made um, just to make sure I tick all the boxes, really. I don't have one specific song or, or genre that I listen to a lot. It just depends on my mood and what I'm in. But I have, I have a fair amount of playlists on Spotify, like... <laughs> Fair, fair play. We you definitely got to get you to share some of those so we can we can spin some of those plays as well. 100%. Uh, yeah, I'll share some of them. Not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> 
and just yeah. know Miley Cyrus is for Ellen White. Quick <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer. I promise. <laughs> 100%. Look, Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure. Honestly, we, we need these kind of interviews because yeah. as much as we want to know about you on, on the pitch and, you know, go through your career and your successes and and all of the, this you know the, the the ups and downs of your career it's also very very important for for fans and people to get to know you as a person off the field as well and i think that that going back to that point around um abuse and stuff online i think a lot of that comes from the fact that people forget that you are just a normal human being you're just a normal person with with interests just like everyone else and i think sometimes people uh blur the lines and forget that a little bit and that's why it's important for us to have these kind of conversations so um we got to say a massive thank you to you thank again you. for coming on you know, we, 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure we we interrupted your your online shopping routine for this afternoon. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not spending any money at the moment. I'm not doing any online shopping. Just saying, disclaimer. Big disclaimer. Yeah, <laughs> but of course, just want to say a massive thank you. Really appreciate you coming on the on the platform, and and hopefully we can um we can we, we can get it done again sometime soon maybe when uh, everything's up and running and, and the shops are open again we can go on a little uh, uh, shopping trip absolutely <laughs> down for that no, sort, sort <laughs> out our wardrobes you know yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to make it good on his best dress me Keely, uh, calm, calm. 100% 100% <laughs> we'll take you up on that offer most definitely so thank you again, Alex. And thank no, you for listening in up until this point in time. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Before we sign out, just a reminder to all of you, if you're not following us on Twitter, it's at podcast underscore TBG. On uh, Instagram, it's at pod underscore TBG. And check out all of our interviews on um, YouTube, the Beautiful Game Podcast. Until the next episode, people, over and out. Peace.